Good evening, Razorback fans, basketball fans. It is a very interesting evening here in Razorback Nation. News came out today as Coach Musselman has accepted a job, is leaving and heading to West to California to take over the job at USC. So, you know, we'll just jump right in here with some reactions. We'll start off with you, David. What's your initial thoughts with that news coming out today after a quick turnaround with news coming out? He interview interview yesterday or today, technically, and things happened pretty fast. So initial thoughts there. Yeah, so certainly this is a situation I think nearly all of Razorback Nation – Saw coming. Um, you know, the moment that the SMU job opened and then infield was announced to be um, one of the candidates for that SMU job, and you started just seeing the dominoes just one by one fall. So, I mean, there were zero surprises today about what was going down. I, I know I was tracking planes today uh, like a lunatic, uh, for those of you who follow our channel. Um, but, yeah, it was one of those – Okay, yeah, there's a charter plane coming in from Los Angeles. Gee, I wonder who that's for, uh, you know, kind of moments. But, you know, for Arkansas overall, this is not what I think some fans out there feel right now. I, I think what this is is just a moment where we're going through a different direction with Arkansas sports. It is not the end of the basketball program like some people – you know, who may not be familiar with like what Razorback basketball is historically and where the direction was already heading before Eric Musselman got here. Eric Musselman took this program to a brand new level that it hadn't been in years, but this program had been on a positive trajectory since the hiring of Mike Anderson. So like there's a lot more going on. And I think right now Arkansas is sitting on the edge of just needing to make the right hire to continue to improve this program. Yeah, that, that, that's so true. And it's one of those things where, you know, I think a lot of people already knew it was one of those situations where if a California job opened up, that's the jobs that you would need to worry about must leaving, not these Louisville jobs that were open or, or things like that. He's always been a San Diego guy, always visits on breaks. He's always out in California. So it's one of those things where when, like David said, alluded to when that job opened, with their coach taking the SMU job, that's when things started to kind of – the wheels started moving, if you will. So, I mean, Maddie, Seth, if you want to chime in here, what are you thinking about this whole situation, you know, just like with what David said and, you know, Razorback Nation right now? Go ahead, Maddie. Yeah, so, I mean, it's something we've kind of talked about in theory all season. Um, you know, like you said, the Louisville job – was kind of the first one to pop up and people started saying, Oh, Mus is going to go there. We knew he he's not going to Louisville. While that is a historic basketball program, if he's going anywhere, it's going to be Southern California. So UCLA or USC, were going to be it. When USC vacated, it was kind of like a whirlwind and just kind of an automatic thing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a shock to Arkansas fans. Um, so I think at this point it's just kind of, finding the right coaching hire um, and getting the fans behind them because there was so much momentum with the fans and coach Muss and how interactive everything was. So I think it's going to be finding that right piece to kind of mesh in with the basketball program, what it is now and getting those recruits because we have had success a lot more recently than in the past. So I think as long as we can kind of keep that rolling with a solid coach, it's going to be a pretty good hire. Yeah, I'll tack on a little bit to that if you don't mind too. I I do think that um, even if this year hadn't have been a bad year, we'll just be blunt with it, it was a bad year. It was a bad year. It was I a bad year. If, no one's no one's hiding from that. <laughs> yeah, it was a bad year. I, I think even if it was a good year and we made you know a tournament run or something of that nature, maybe might be talking a little different if there was a Final Four or something like that. But it, say he made it to another Sweet Sixteen and we lost in Sweet Sixteen, I still think there's a lot of potential for him to leave for that USC job if it's open, even if this was a great year. Um, I, you you guys already spoke to it quite a bit, but that's where he wants to be. You know, I, I think Arkansas was a great temporary home for him. He did a lot of great things here and showed that he can recruit really well, can coach pretty well, um, especially when it comes to tournament time, when it really counts, you know. So I, I appreciate everything he did for the university, but I, I don't think – I think too many fans are thinking that it's because we had a bad year is why he's leaving. I actually don't think that's 100% the case. 
I do think that this could have been a potential uh, possibility, even if we had had a good year since this position opened. Um, so with that said, go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. I was just going to tack on exactly what you were saying there, because like, we were talking about this uh, this morning, literally in my NCAA governance class. Um, and we were talking about the contract situations and everything else that coaches face and why coaches leave. Honestly, it's these most of the time it's not for the reasons that you hear on Twitter, like, oh, there's all this drama and there's all this going on behind the scenes. Most coaches just hang out our program for 4.1 years. That's the average tenure of a college coach. And so for Eric Musselman to be here five years is still above average. Um, and then it was an opportunity for him to move home. Most of the time coaches leave for personal reasons or things like more money or job advancement. It's not anything that the fan base did. It's oftentimes not even necessarily what NIL is doing or anything like that. And I think for Eric Musselman, this was an opportunity to get closer to home for a place that he wanted to be. Heck, we even heard him say it in some of his press conferences that it's Northwest Arkansas, number two, number one, is like SoCal. So, I mean, like that's, that's the reality of it is that this was an opportunity for him to go home at a pretty good program and one that, Needs some hope like, you know, Arkansas needed a couple of years ago in a program that he can build up into something special and get some good rivalry games between UCLA there and Los Angeles. I was about to say, it's going to be one of those things he's going to have to get used to a whole different atmosphere with a school that the past, you know, four to five years average attendance 5,000 or less. A midweek bomb walker game. Yeah, exactly. And you're you're going from playing to a packed out Bud Arena, Bud Walton, to that. So that's going to be a little bit tough. But like you said, he's going to have to build that if he wants um, that notoriety. And it's going to be a challenge for him. I mean, he's going from a easily really top 15 program in Arkansas to USC that's not really a basketball school. I mean, they've had some average success with their previous coach that, you know, made some runs, had some consistency, but – it's still not to the same level of Arkansas and playing in the SEC. No, it's not. And it's also a very difficult situation in the modern Big Ten that they're going to be moving into. I mean, we're talking about four West Coast teams and like, what, 18? I don't know how many teams are actually in the Big Ten right now. I haven't counted them up, but like everybody else is out east. They're sitting in Ohio, Michigan, um, New Jersey for Rutgers. Um, you know, so like all these long trips at the, you know, it's going to be hard to get players on board with that. But USC is a huge brand and there's a ton of basketball talent out there in California. So I don't doubt that Eric Musselman will have success at USC. Will it be the same level to success he had at Arkansas? I don't know. Jury's going to be out on that. But I think there's the potential for that. Um, but I, I don't think this was anything to do with Arkansas necessarily. I think this had everything to do with there being an opening at USC and an opportunity to go home. And, I mean, all of us get homesick and want to get home at some point, you know, and have success in that area. Yeah. I mean, let's be real. We all know Coach Muss loved the, the theatrical part of it. Um, brought in Duke Deuce, brought in Walk Flocka. There were so many different people. USC has a school funded by Dr. Dre. That's going to be right up his alley. we got to be happy. Say, one of the biggest fans of Snoop Dogg of USC. So. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, he'll have th those people there readily. And so, you know, as we're talking about Coach Moss and what he's done for Arkansas, you know, you, you start breaking it down, look at the record. His record at Arkansas, he went 111 and 59. In conference, 47 and 42, so closer to that 500 mark in conference play. Eight and three in the NCAA tournament with zero conference titles. So, you know, you look at it, decent record in in those five years with an overall record, kind of struggled in conference play. But I, I think for me, when I look at it, I'd rather be okay in conference play and see that eight and three in NCAA tournament play than having more success in your conference play and not really doing anything in the NCAA tournament other than, you know, making it in and then you maybe make it one or two rounds. Instead, you know, we had average conference play record, but made it to three sweet 16s and an elite eight. Yeah, I think anytime you make the second weekend, it's about the same tier as, um, you know, a conference title at a lot of times, uh, not necessarily in every case, um, you know, certainly like last year for Arkansas, I don't think Arkansas's run of the Sweet 16 was the equivalent of a conference title that year, but for the Elite Eight runs, certainly, because those were good teams that were in the top four of the SEC and it played well in conference. 
and then went deep into March. Those were really good teams, those first, uh, that second and third year for Moss. But yeah, the conference success was the only thing that I think Razorback fans had any complaint when it came to Eric Musselman is like this year and the year prior. Um, and even a little bit, not so much, but it was a weaker SEC in 2019, in 2019 2020, his first year at Arkansas. Um, so, you know, you would maybe expect a little bit more success, but he was in a rebuild mode at that point. I don't think you can hold anything on that. But, yeah, you would have liked to see more conference success, but March was definitely the pinnacle for Moss's tenure at, at Fayetteville. Yeah, I've talked about it with a friend, um, and, you know, we, we kind of were discussing this conference – time versus NCAA tournament time. And a lot of the time you take a look more at conference records and, um, you know, conference success are for mid-major schools. They don't make it as much in the NCAA tournament, but they have a lot of conference accolades. I would much rather be on a top tier level where you're making it far in the NCAA tournament, getting your name out there to everybody across the country and just not in your conference. Um, so definitely, I think something to build on something, like I said earlier, um, that gives you accolades for recruiting rather than just like, oh, yeah, we've done well in conference the past three years. Hey, we made it to the NCAA tournament the past three years. Which team is that 17, 18 year old going to commit to? That's a good point. <laughs> one, one thing that really comes to my mind, it's kind of a stretch of a comparison, but uh, two years ago, Ole Miss winning the College World Series in baseball um, had a uh, an abysmal conference record that year, uh, but then found a way to make it to Omaha and then won the whole dang thing after a not so great year, all things considered in baseball. You don't really remember the bad years. You remember that they won the Natty. So that, that's, that's a prime example of, you, you know, you, you can't worry about those records as much as some people try to put some emphasis on. And it really does come down to how well do you perform in crunch time in those tournament scenarios and, how many championships can you rack up? Do you think there's a single at fan in Alabama right now talking about how they did in conference play this season? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, there, there's not a single Tide fan who cares right now that where they finished in conference play. They're in the final four, and that's where you want to be at the end of the day. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah, that's where you want to be in the biggest games uh, every season. Yeah, that's true. And so when you're talking about Muss and you know his tenure here, that makes you start to think, you know, where. Would you rank Muss in a sense of how in, in the list of Arkansas coaches that Arkansas had over the years? And you think the, the most notable success you think of that everybody knows is Nolan Richardson with the 94 championship team, the success that Eddie Sutton had. You have Eugene Lambert, Glenn Rose, and then you I think you put Musselman in your top five there. And I think it's safe to say that I think that's a good spot because you look like you look at what he's done and coming into Arkansas – and really bringing them back to relevance and doing something that hadn't been done in, you know, 20 years, getting us to the NCAA tournament, taking us to sweet 16s, elite eights. I, I think that's a lot for a coach to come in and do and quote unquote, a short amount of time with how Musman does it with the transfer portal, not necessarily recruiting and, and building rosters and, you know, kind of developing players. He brings guys in, constructs a roster and makes a run. And he did it in just five years. Yeah. Like, let's let's be fair. It, it took Mike Anderson a while to get consistent at Arkansas in his tenure to get this team regularly in the NIT and the NCAA tournament. For Eric Musselman, like, he's probably one step ahead of Mike Anderson. Again, there's only been 13 coaches in the history of Arkansas basketball. Um if you include Dana Altman or not, 14. Um, but like for this situation, you know, Eric Musselman, yeah, the guys who are in front of him are guys who have been to Final Fours. Like, you know, that, you know, Glenn Rose, Nolan Richardson, Eddie Sutton, they took that next step. They won conference tournaments, they won conference, you know, regular season titles. Um, that's just where Eric Musselman's kind of sitting at. But his tenure here in just five years was extremely effective and it brought a new level to Arkansas and rejuvenation to the program. So, if he's a middle coach where five kind of sits at when you talk about 13 coaches all time, you know, he's definitely at the top of the middle tier of coaches uh, for his tenure at Arkansas. And it's really just because his tenure was short, you know, is what at the end of the day compared to guys like Nolan and Glenn Rose. Yeah, it really makes you think he, he might be higher up this list if he stayed another two or three years and makes, it, you know, two or three more runs in the NCAA tournament. But like, like David said, you know, with it being such a short tenure with just five years, and it, you you got to note that that is the longest he stayed any of his other previous stops. So he, he's been here longer than he stays at most places. 
And I think that's another thing that hog fans had to consider, you know, when all this kind of after the SEC tournament, kind of all these rumblings started of him being associated with this job or that job. Musselman's a guy that moves around and doesn't stay in a place long. And so you, you kind of had to figure he was out there kind of starting to look for his next move and what he was going to do. Yeah, certainly. So I, th- I think one thing too, um, to kind of tack onto that, I think, the first couple of days, nobody was really too worried about, oh, the Louisville job, he's not going to that. I think he'll stick around. There was rumblings about, you know, an extension getting presented to him, uh, rumblings about maybe trying to get some more NIL funding, uh, things of that nature. But it seemed like it went a little bit longer and longer without hearing an official, hey, he's back, hey, he's back, in- anything, you know, on pen to paper. And co- this this past four, five, six days, you know, I was texting Caleb quite a bit. It just kind of felt like the writing was on the wall that he was leaving and not returning with how long it had taken to have anything solidified that he was coming back. So it didn't necessarily come as a surprise to me. Um, I think some people were still kind of hanging on to hope. But the fact that it took so long for anything to come out made me think that there was some some more meat to what was out there about him leaving, and, and that is the case. But um, I, I completely agree with kind of the, the rankings of coaches. Um, and I do think that if he would have stuck around a little bit longer, I wish he would have, frankly, just my own opinion. Um, I, I do think he, you know, might could have got us to that final four, maybe a, a potential championship game. Not, not sure if he would have won it or not, but I think he was a coach with that kind of potential. Well, Caleb, I remember you texting me and, um, you know, just tanking on what Seth said here. And you texted me right when the USC job opened. You go, do you think Musk would leave for USC? And my immediate response to you was absolutely. Yeah. Um, like it, it's just a job that's attractive to him. And like I was talking about earlier, there's a lot of times the drama and everything else that fans talk about on social media is just really not the reality of what's going on. Uh, so, I mean at the end of the day, we know why he moved. It's because this was an opportunity that he wanted. And that's why my response to you was just so, you know, direct. (laughs) So yeah, was like, yeah, this is a job he wants, but I would love to see, I would love, you know, I'd love to see him have success out there at USC. Uh, I, I, as a Razorback fan, I don't wish anything well against him because I'm very happy of where he brought this program um, for the years that it was struggling there for a while. So it's great to see, um, it's great to see where we're at as a program now. And I'm, I'm anxious to talk about the future as well of this program. Yeah. And, and I think one thing a lot of people aren't talking about as much is, you know, I, I think not this decision may not have been 100% muscle. I mean, you've got to consider his wife, Danielle. She, yes, she's from Arkansas, but you got to think she's had careers in broadcasting and, and think about the opportunities of Fayetteville, Arkansas, compared to Los Angeles, California. You know, she's going to have opportunities if what she wants to do is get back into some type of broadcasting. What opportunities or what's going to be a better place to get those opportunities? Staying here or going to, you know, L.A. where there's probably hundreds of broadcasting jobs that are available that she could go out there and look at. Well, as someone who's worked in LA, I can tell you there's a lot of work out there um, for the media world, but I, I'll also just throw this on top of it. I mean, look at this list that we're talking about right now. Out of that list right there, since 1985, no coach out of the big three, as far as I know, baseball might be the exception. There might be some guy that I'm not thinking about in baseball right now, but at least in football and basketball, no one has left this school unless it was under the will, under retirement or it was termination like eddie sutton was the last coach to leave arkansas uh, like eric musselman did in 1985 and why did he leave arkansas because he really really wanted to be the head coach at kentucky uh he said that he would crawl there to be the head coach at kentucky um so like yeah this kind of feels almost exactly like the sutton situation which we're all too young to have lived in but like to, as we interpret it from history that's kind of where we're at is that there was one job there was one opportunity and it made sense. And that's, I think that's where the story's at right now. And at the end of the day, like, like I said, the next coaching hire is going to be a big one because like it's to continue the trajectory of what must built at Arkansas. That's very true. And, and, you know, as we transition here, you know, what you've got to think about with must leaving is the roster situation. You know, it, it, with, even if must was still here, it still wasn't looking great. You know, before Musk left, you had, you know, all these guys out of eligibility, Makai, Jalen, L. Ellis, Jeremiah Davenport, Lawson. You had Pinion, Devo, Layden, Denjay, all 
that had entered the portal. But then as of today, you have some more additions, you know, with everything going on, I'm not, I don't blame them. You have Bayfall, which he was one of those that, you know, I think a lot of people thought was on the fence, whether he'd come back or not. And then Khalif Battle, a guy that, you know, if Musk would have stayed is, you know, you think he's a guy that comes back that you built your team around. Well, with the news coming out today, those two guys are gone. And then just, you know, right as we started up the show, the news came out. Josh Cohen, the commit from UMass, has flipped his commitment to USC and is following Musk. And, you know, he said that that was his reason for committing to Arkansas was to play for Musk. So I'm not surprised there. But that leaves you with Tremont Mark and Trevor Brazil, your two guys that are on the roster that haven't said anything publicly as far as what they are going to do. So whoever is the next coach has got a lot of work to do to come in. Maybe he can re-recruit some of these guys to stay, such as Cleef Battle, Aiden Blocker, those guys. Maybe he can, you know, come in and re-recruit them to stay at the school. I mean, I mean, it's going to be an interesting situation looking at this roster for next season. First off, I want to say, Skeeter, I see your comment and the uh, in the in the comments over here. And yes, I'm very well Mike where Mike Anderson needs a job. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to just note on this is that I think you're exactly right, Caleb. I, I think there's an opportunity right now for whoever that next coach is to talk to some of these guys about coming back for Arkansas and getting some playing time. Like Layton Blocker's from here. Um, you know, Joe's opinion, I know he signed with Arkansas State, um, but Debo Davis, for example, from Jacksonville, uh, hasn't committed anywhere. There's guys that could easily come back um, that you can start building this round, but it's going to be a very active portal season without Musselman this year. Um, you know, so there's going to be a lot of guys that whoever the next coach is going to be is going to be contacting in this portal right now to build something at Arkansas going forward who that coach is can make a huge splash for what next year's team is going to be. Because right now the NCAA tournament's, you know, still going on names are entering the portal every second right now. It feels like um, there are still players out there that are maybe talking to one coach who may be interested in coming over to a different school. If that coach should come to Arkansas. Uh, so the landscape is that this is going to be a very active portal season overall. Yeah. yeah and you'd see, I think several players similar to Josh Cohen, where, if, you know, we get a coach from a different school who's already got a decently built roster, decide that they want to follow him over here to Arkansas. Um, so, you know, I think there's a possibility to get a lot of players that way. And then obviously another possibility of just straight up recruitment, um, work in the transfer portal. Uh, no, they called most the importer, but um, hopefully we'll have, have a little bit of that and uh, whoever our next hire is. Well, I would also like to throw out, I'm curious what happens now with uh, Elohim and Shelly. Um, what's what the future there? Of course, Elohim's from California. We could, I don't know what that situation is going to play out. And, you know, especially with Musk going to USC. Um, so we'll, we'll see how those cards fall. Um, who wanted to come to Arkansas and who wanted to play with Musk? That's kind of the question out of those freshmen. But we'll we'll see how that plays out. That was going to be my point as well on, on who are those incoming freshmen actually keep that commitment um, try to get out of their NLIs. But uh, I think one one more thing to add, too, um, kind of like you guys said, I, I think that's something that needs to be considered in the hiring process. I know it's not something you want to kind of be the make or break factor, but I do think it's something you you do got to think about if you're um, oh, Hunter Juracek, that you want to be able to get somebody that at least can – work well with the portal there's some coaches out there that just don't that refuse to um and i think you got to eliminate those coaches from the hiring pool if you will because you know you have to have at least a decent bounce back from this scenario um to kind of continue that trajectory you're on you mentioned david so you got to go out and get somebody you know not necessarily like a Deion sanders type hire where he brings his entire team with him <laughs> uh, maybe not something that crazy but you, you gotta be thinking about that i think if you're on the hiring end of things you, you got to go find somebody that's at least pretty well versed in utilizing the portal as well as recruiting past that. Um, so, so there's a lot of boxes that I think need checked um, for whoever the hire is going to be. There's a couple of names floating around. I'm not going to go too crazy down that road because who knows, but that's mm -hmm. something that's got to be considered. I think. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll throw one of the names that's getting thrown around a lot right now because I don't think it's a secret. Um, you know, if you read <laughs> social media, but I will say this coach had a pretty darn good first year. Uh, at Ole Miss, and uh, <laughs> if he should be the guy, if he, you know, if he is, 
he pulled a lot of good names. So, or a lot of decent names, I should say, to build a halfway decent team at Ole Miss last this season. One that, you know, smoked up a Q4 non-conference schedule and had a great record coming into conference play and then did some good things at times during conference play. So, yeah, not saying he's the guy, but, you know. He, he, he checks a lot of those boxes. He checks a lot of those boxes for that first year um, because, like, yeah, there's a resume point sitting there. I was about to say, yeah, we'll go ahead and switch over here. You know, from what we've heard on social media, you know, these three names here are the three that have been thrown out, you know, as far as a lot of people are saying these are your top three, you know, particularly maybe in this exact order with Chris Beard at Ole Miss, you know, just like Dave mentioned, you know, his first season at Ole Miss and he puts up a 20-win season. And then, you know, he was able to bring in some guys and build a decent roster at Ole Miss that's not a basketball school at all. No. You know, that's probably their third sport behind football and baseball. So he, if he's able to go in and do that at that level of school, what could he do at if he jumped over to Arkansas, who, if you can remember correctly, was his coach at ULR and took them on a run as well? Chris Beard is just the guy that a lot of people are going to be talking about, and uh, I'm not going to confirm or deny any rumors uh, at this point. But I, I will say that as far as the fans see it, he's the front runner. And, you know, talking about what his success could be, first year at Ole Miss, he still had a top 60 offense in the country. Uh, he had a top 15 offense, last, you know, his final year in Texas. He had a top 30 offense uh, in, you know, at Texas the year prior. Um, and he had a top 25 defense the or offense the year that he took Texas Tech to the final four. Um, so this is a very offensive minded coach, which is very different um, from what the past has looked like in Arkansas under Musselman, which has had very good defenses, final four caliber defenses. Well, Chris Beard could produce his final four caliber offenses. And he also produces final four caliber defenses as well. He had the number one defense in the country the year they made the final four on Kempom and they had a top 35 defense every year that he was at Texas. He can be a very successful coach and he's one who likes to put his players in a position to succeed. It's not all play driven. It's a lot of times just making sure guys are in the right spot uh, is how he operates. Um, but I, I think we all know the elephant in the room. Like when we yeah, talk, yeah, I was going to say, can we just point out the glaringly obvious fact that one of these coaches is not like the others? Yes. I mean, yeah. Jerome Tang is the squeaky clean one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the difference is that like out of the names that are getting thrown out there, Jerome Tang, my only hang up with Jerome Tang is the lack of head coaching experience. Like that, that's really it. Um, he was an assistant for Baylor for a really long time. Um, you know, and even was an associate head coach under Scott Drew, but like Kansas State is the only job that he really has at the division one level of uh, that's you know significant on his resume. And it's in all honesty, it's one good year, one good year for Jerome Tang. Um, and certainly he was coach of the year, he's a great coach, he's a great coach, but you know, you're, you're taking a gamble there, and I, I feel like it's certainly a gamble, and it's one that kind of may stress some Razorback fans out because you want to move a guarantee to move forward is what you want to, what you're thinking here. I just want to say the best prospect um, for me in terms of Jerome Tang is all of the Wu Tang merch <laughs> that is going to come out of it. Like that, that's going to be my favorite thing. I just want to want to throw that out there. Yeah. And, and, and it's like a lot of people have been saying on, you know, you know, social media and whatnot, you know, especially with, you know, maybe the higher beard or if it's Wade, you know, start to embrace, you know, the theme of dark and saw, you know, <laughs> with, with bringing back Bobby Petrino, you know, that, that was a big splash this off season with football where it seemed like there's a lot of hoops to jump through to bring him back for a second stint in Arkansas. And now you're going to turn around and, you know, just like we said to one of these coaches, isn't like the others. And two of those would be kind of down that same route of, yeah, they're a great coach, can produce the wins, but what's the off-court look like? Yeah, I just want to point something else out, and I'm not going to take um, long doing this, but I, I just want to talk about the difference between hiring Bobby Petrino and what it would be like saying hiring another one of these coaches. Um, you know, for for Bobby Petrino, it was 10 years ago when the incident at Arkansas had occurred. He also had a 
clean record, you know, so to speak, at the other programs that he went to. He didn't get in any trouble or anything like that. It's only 15 months removed for Chris Beard, um, which is partially, you know, my concern. Like this isn't this isn't the same type of scenario at all. Um, for Will Wade, yeah, I see that point. The, the that's going to be part of the conversation with Will Wade too. But like, don't forget, he's also under sanctions right now uh, and limited in what he can do in recruiting. And for Arkansas right now, I think that's a non-starter. Um, you know, is that you have to be able to recruit, you have to be able to develop in the transfer portal and everything else. I, I don't necessarily think that's the best. And let's not forget this: if the Arkansas hired Will Wade, it'd be about the funniest hire you could possibly make. Um, you know, Arkansas fans memed. Teletubbies um, and everything else when it came to Will Wade and wore FBI jackets to games. Like the fan base, like re the student section, just I, I don't know how to put it. But like, it's like, yeah. Can you imagine an entire student section dressed up as the FBI behind Will Wade? I saw it multiple times. Other fan bases doing it too. Like it, it was crazy. And like that was the Will Wade era at LSU, and L LSU hold, held on to him as long as they could until the pay until the, uh, until he got served. So, I mean, like I, he takes a year off, hosts the podcasts and then comes back to college basketball. Um, I, I don't know if that's the guy that you necessarily want to go with. If you're Arkansas, um, I, I I'm kind of a left field guy. I, I'm thinking in different directions, but like, yeah, these are certainly the names that we've seen pop up about 200 million times across social media right now with fans. Yeah. And, and let's run through this real quick. You mean, Break it down. You look at Chris Beard. We've talked about it. he's had tremendous success. You know, you know, a record overall of 256 and 109 in his power six conference record, 66 and 59, 10 and four in the NCAA tournament, three conference titles. But that's where you've got to note, you know, he was fired from Texas after that felony arrest, you know, arrest because he had his success at UALR, made the jump to Texas Tech, had a good run, you know, with several years there, taking on the tournament, taking on the title game. Then he makes the jump from there to Texas where all this goes down. It, it is good to note that the charges were dropped by the Travis County Department. So, and then there's the other rumor around that Arkansas fans, it's hard to confirm or deny whether – Chris Beard has officially signed the extension that he was offered during the SEC tournament. That's a, that would be a big factor into as far as what Arkansas goes after, because that could be a difference in buyout money and w what Arkansas wants to do there. Yeah, certainly. So uh, it, I, I don't know any of the truth about that, but that's one of those sources say moments. And I, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. Um, so I haven't put any FOIA requests out there to Ole Miss to find that out or not. Um, but uh, I'm curious as well what the situation is there in that. Uh, I've heard coaches doing that in the past because they know certain jobs may or may not be open and then putting it off for a little bit. So we'll see. Yeah, I um, think that may have a big impact on if you do go after him or not, you know, barring all of the, the elephants in the room, if you will. What what does the buyout look like if you want to go out and get somebody like this? Because you know you're going to have to pay them on our end as well. And then I think you want to uh, not overextend yourself um, either. So I, I think that's going to be a kind of a critical piece on if that's actually confirmed that he did not sign an extension. Yeah, and like I said, you're also got this potential where you can also divide the fan base and certain. I, I think this is more controversial to put certain members of the fan base than others. You got one section of the fan base who are saying, you know, going the Al Davis approach and saying just win, baby, um, you know, and that's that's what's going to fill in nobody's perfect kind of situation. But you're also going to have fans that are also going to say part of the contract is also to be a mentor uh, as a coach. It's right there in your contract. And the other side of this is that this is an academic institution, not the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, so like that's that's going to be just I, I think that has a potential to be kind of divisive amongst Razorback fans and I worry about that as well um uh, I think if you went this route you got to do some PR work like that's that's the biggest thing and, yeah because like I know he made he talked about it when he was hired at Ole Miss I know it got talked about but at the exact same time it was right in the middle of the NCAA tournament when he got hired and, you know, I don't think nationally, like people are aware of that. And you're talking about a bigger program going to Arkansas with reach and college basketball. And let's not forget this story made national news. Um, so there's a lot of people who still haven't heard what Chris Beard might have to say on this incident. Yeah. 
And, and another good point you look got to look at too is with with Musk taking that USC job, USC is going to be paying the university his buyout of a million dollars. So you know, is that something that is going to kind of be reused, if you will, towards whatever maybe with the new coach, whether it be his buyout, his contract? You know, another thing with Chris Beard that I've heard you know today was. You know, with him having that stint at UALR, he made some good contacts down there that might be willing to, you know, help out and any up the money, if you will, to get him out of his old Miss contract in, into Arkansas. Certainly so. So you jump over to the next name we talked about, Jerome Tang. You know, record 45 and 24, you know, in power six, 19 and 17. So right about 500, sitting at three and one in NCAA tournament games. Zero conference titles, like we just mentioned earlier. A fairly new head coach, at least at this level, you know, with this being his just finishing up his second year at Kansas State, you know, where he had that fantastic run year one. You know, he had, had an okay year this year. I think he had some injury issues that he had to deal with with several players. Um, but looking at this, like we've said, this is the guy that you're looking at that's the cleaner option, if you will, between the three that we've talked about. Yeah, and I, I don't want to dismiss the fact, like, if you want to jump over to the next slide there, Caleb, uh, that we put together about his, uh, well, I thought it was on there, about Tang's uh, assistant coaching record. We'll go back, yeah. Um, but he spent years, I mean, years, uh, with that development that Scott Drew did in Baylor uh, and building that program up to what it is today. So, I mean, it's not like he's just totally lost uh, when it comes to, building a power six program or being a part of big time winning basketball. He was part of that staff that won a national championship. Jerome Tang's done some great things, but I, like I said, I think the only big concern with Jerome Tang is the fact that not enough people are, you know, may not be, or not enough people might be comfortable with the fact that he has such a limited resume as a head coach. And that's, that's the biggest concern. I think one of the things that you you look at with Jerome Tang too, um, you know, was very important to Arkansas fans with Muss. He did have a couple of uh, NBA draft picks. He had um, some great recruiting. He basically snatched up Tyler Perry from Arkansas a couple of years ago, who you know is now testing the NBA waters. So you know, I, I think that's another plus for him is that he has a little bit of experience with recruiting with recruiting. Um, and kind of being close to the area, he's going to have some decent contacts as well um, that could help us even extend a little bit into the Midwest. Well, you know, the Midwest up there in Kansas and then also, like I said, Baylor's in Texas where we've gotten plenty of athletes over the years in all our sports. Uh, so it's like I said, it's not a guy without connections. It's not a guy without experience. It, it's 100 percent. It's it. I don't know, if Seth, if you feel the same way or not, but it's the head coaching record. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think you've got somebody that's – they're both risky in their own ways, if you will, um, where, where this one's more of a risk on the actual basketball side of things, whereas, he, you know, he hasn't proven himself for as long of the amount of time as Chris Beard has. Chris Beard has had success everywhere he's gone. Tang has as well, but not quite at that head coaching level. So that's the one place where you kind of have a little bit of risk. And then Chris Beard, you have a little bit of risk on the off-the-court things where I, I want to say he's kind of – made some corrections, if you will, and uh, hopefully things are on the right track in his personal life. Um, but you don't know that for sure. And and so that's a risk on that side of things. So I, I really do, in my opinion, as of right now, for things I've seen and heard, I think it's kind of a, a two-horse race between these guys, and I really think it's going to come down to Hernan Yurchek and then obviously a lot of the boosters and the people pulling the strings for the university, if you will, um, kind of on, on which route we decide to go. And I think there's a couple arguments you could make for both sides. Um, I, I would be happy with either one. I'll just go out there and say that I really would. Um, I, I want to say I think I lean more towards the Chris Beard side because I'm kind of a let's win this thing guy. But at, at the same time, you know, I completely understand the connotation that can come along with that. So as, in my eyes right now, I don't even think Will Wade's in the picture. But – that's just from my perspective and kind of my my type of thinking and just what I've seen. But uh, I, as of right now, I'd be cool with either one of these guys. I do think, you know, maybe there's a higher risk, just Jerome Tang not having as much head coach experience. But he has done good things where he's went, and to your point, he's been a part of some big, big programs, and I think that could bode well for him. Yeah, certainly so. And like I said, it 
I'm like you. When we talk about Will Wade, it almost feels like a non-starter. I'd rather go out and poach a coach uh, somewhere along the P6 level and go find somebody who we not, we're not even thinking about right now. Maybe somebody who's kind of stagnant at a good program, but you think could do well uh, if they brought him to a program with a little bit more resources like Arkansas. So like, or even go to the middle major level and roll the dice with someone like Bucky McMillan. Like, I, I think those are all things that I would go to first before Will Wade. Um, 100% feel yeah, the same way. Yeah, because like the recruiting situation with Will Wade just kind of, I, I don't know what you do with that. Like, you know, Arkansas has got to recruit. Arkansas has got to build. That's just facts. Yeah, I bet they would already just... talked about our current roster, so yes, obviously <laughs> there, there's a lot of gaps to fill, and I, I don't think Will Wade's the man to do it and bring us a winning season this next year. Yeah, I was about to say, Maddie, you read my mind. That's what I was going to say. You look at how depleted the roster is, and if you're hampered with recruiting things that you can't do or you've got restrictions th with this roster needing an overhaul and you're needing to bring in at least you know, 12 to 13 players, you, you've got to be able to go all out in that recruiting. And I think out of these three, this one is the like even riskier choice because you're, you're betting on – can you get it done with these restrictions? And, I mean, like we said, he was terminated at LSU after he got served with NCAA recruiting violations, all of which, you know, Skeeter made a good point, are technically legal now, but back then they weren't. Yeah. So. Makes you wonder what else he would try that's not legal still. <laughs> well, there's a whole wide world right now that's being debated in the NCAA. Trust me, I, I deal with yeah. that every day in my NCAA law class. <laughs> a lot of and things so, are going to change over the next five years, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so you look at it, you start looking at jobs, power five coaching changes. So, you know, we see Pat Kelsey taking the Louisville job, Kyle Smith taking Stanford, Dusty May from FAU, one of the hot names, taking Michigan, Darian DeVries taking West, West Virginia. Virginia. Chris Holtman taking DePaul, Jake Dabler taking Ohio State, Steve Letts taking Oklahoma State, Andy Enfield, as we know from SC, taking SMU, Mark Byington taking Vanderbilt, and Danny Sprinkle taking Washington. So that's the changes that we've had so far this season. And then you can, for whoever Arkansas hold hires, you can throw them on the list too. So this has been a very – interesting and chaotic off season with all these coaching changes. Okay. We'll just jump over to the next slide because like, this is the big one that I really want to talk about right now. Look at these other jobs right now that are open right now on the carousel. There's not another P six job open. And we're talking about a top 20 to top 15 job that's open right now in college basketball. There's no one to play with Arkansas right now. The problem is, is a lot of the candidates that were really the hot names coming in like Dusty May, Pat Kelsey, those names are gone. But right now you have a position to where you might be able to find a coach that you really, really want uh, if you're Arkansas. And it's an attractive job. So right now you don't have any competitors in the market with you. And that's why I was talking about the poach coach thing a little bit earlier is I think you can go find somebody no one's even thinking about. I think that's true. And I think you bring up a good point there that it, it could be almost a blessing in disguise. I think a lot of people think it's a curse just – not necessarily a curse, but the time is bad. The time yeah, is bad, but like the opportunity is huge. Yes, 100%. So, if things work out the way that they might could, it could kind of circle back and be a good thing that it happened a little bit later in the offseason. I think a lot of people were hoping for if he was going to make a change. The, the one area where it really hurts you the most, not necessarily is coaching, it's it's that transfer portal where you've already got a lot of guys that you would want to go try to, you know, make a run at that. They've already committed somewhere else because you, you don't have a coach. And there was a lot of conjecture on where your coach was even going to be outside of all this. So I, I think that's why, you know, I, I think I'd heard a stat. We had reached out to like 19 players or something like that and never got any, any type of commitments until – the uh, one from UMass, he was the only one. I think there was a lot of reasons as to why there wasn't many commitments coming in. There was all this conjecture. I think a lot of people kind of knew that there was some cogs turning. And uh, so I feel like we're a little bit behind the eight ball on the transfer portal. And that does make, I think, the next coaching hire that much more critical. It, it does definitely makes the next coaching hire that much more critical. But it, it, it also, you know, would you sacrifice one year to have 10 great ones to follow? And um, that, that's the question that I think we're sitting on right now, because this is, this is a great job. And I mean, like we were talking about no coach has left this job since 1985 uh, to go to a different, to go to a different position. Uh, none of us were alive. 
uh, who are talking here right now. And from a historic basis, even before Eric Musselman got here, this was considered a top 25 job in the country. Um, you know, your closest peer in this conference is Florida historically, who has the one national championship, but you have overall more March success. Um, and then, you know, Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish on Ion College Basketball before the season started ranked Arkansas as one of the top 15 jobs in the country right now. Um, this is a huge place with the ninth, ninth largest uh, stadium in the country. Um, you have 19,000 fans giving you the best, one of the best home field or home court advantages in college basketball. You're sitting 15th all time in NCAA tournament appearances. And that'll be also when Texas and Oklahoma join the conference. You'll still be at least third all time in the SEC. You're 14th in the country in college basketball revenue. And then your NIL situation is not necessarily what fans are making it out to be. You're behind the SEC average, but you're actually really darn good. And this program has invested a lot in basketball over the years. Um, you're right around the SEC average uh, is where it is. So, And as a program, compared to the rest of the Power Six, you're actually about what the projection is on NIL NCAA is about $2 million better than most power six programs. So this is still a very attractive job uh, right now in a program that's very dedicated to basketball. Yeah. And, and that's one thing, you know, Seth kind of hit on it there. You got to think of timeline when you're bringing in your coach, cause you're going to get this done as soon as you can, because you have the transfer portal window that's going to close at the end of the month. So, you you look at the timeline. You get a coach in. He's going to have give or take two and a half to three weeks to go out and hit this transfer portal while he can. Well, let's not also forget that they you know just because it closes in three weeks doesn't mean that the game is over. John Calipari brought in Trey Mitchell last year after decision day, uh, after players had announced that they're going to the NBA and everything else. So like it, it's not over over. Um, you know, decision day and the end of the transfer portal is what pretty much everybody talks about. And that's when majority of things have hit. But like overall, the games, the games by no means over. And right now, when you look at the top recruits right now, um, you know, the number one player, Maxine Renard, is undecided. Janelle Davis, undecided. Clifford uh, Omanaya out of Rutgers, undecided. Um, you know, you're looking at AJ Stork out of Wisconsin, still undecided. And then several guys out there, you know, like Malik Mack, who Arkansas has already made contact with as, le as well as Amari Williams are undecided. Like there's, those are guys who are all in the top 15. I just named that are undecided right now on, on three. So there's still, if you make this coach coaching hire quick enough, you can make some contacts with some really, really good guys. And I was looking at the roster turnover right now. There aren't many SEC teams that even have a transfer committed at this point. Um, like there's, there's a lot they could be doing that you can do. So if you get the right coach, Arkansas enters the chat all of a sudden on a lot of these, on a lot of these guys. And with a new coach that brings new energy and new money into a fan base. So it, it just depends on who that hire is. And is it someone that can go out into the portal and get guys to start building a program immediately? Yeah. And then you got to also think how many transfers are going to have be had once that coach, if they're from a different program, decides to come to Arkansas and how many are following him. Yeah, certainly. So there's, there's always that chance too. like, who's going to be the guy who wants to follow. Um, you know, like we were talking about Chris Baird earlier. Does John ball, does John ball follow? I know that Arkansas just lost Bay fall. That's the same position. And we're talking about a top 100 player and one of the, what's this NBA class stinks, but as far as freshman next year, Next year's NBA class looks extremely prompt or next this next crop of freshmen who are going to be entering the NBA draft as one and done's down the road is very promising. This next year's group is. And like, yeah, John Ball is one of those top 100 guys. He's going to be one of the top 50 uh, prospects or one of the top 15 prospects coming into the SEC. So if he follows Beard to Arkansas, if that was the situation, you've already got one piece in place out of a very talented freshman out of overtime elite. Yeah, that's true. And so, you know, we've talked about these names out there and, and we'll jump over, you know, social media kind of speaks for itself. If you look at <laughs> this was a landslide when I put it up, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it's not even close. It's clear who Arkansas fans, at least from social media's perspective and on, you know, Twitter want it's they want Chris Beard. I mean, at what point in this coaching process, you know, I know you're checking and the university do their due diligence, but at, at what point do they see this and be like, well, the fans really want this guy. 
do we go out and make a run at this guy to see what happens? Well, let me tell you, it's I don't think it's going to be just the fans who have that voice. I think it's going to be the donors and the board who have that voice. And I'm saying if fans have that kind of opinion, there's probably a donor or two who also shares that opinion. And um, I, I would not surprise me if Arkansas is talking to Chris Beard, you know, at this point. But also on the flip side, I, I know we're we're all from Arkansas who are, are, are speaking here. A lot of those donors and board members are going to have the big question of morality. So that's where I get hung up um, when it comes to Chris Beard, when it comes to Will Wade. I'm with you. I understand. Seth, what were you saying? No, I'll just – I was saying fingers crossed because that would be kind of my my choice. Um, but but to you guys, you know, your last point there, I, that was that was always the discussions that were brought up a lot. Is uh, I don't think even some of the donors were necessarily happy about the Bobby Petrino hire. I think that you just had some of those outweigh the others. So I think there were some splits. That's just kind of been the the rumor mill going around. But the, I think there was even some splits around the Bobby Petrino hire due to the morality reasons that had already been talked about back during football hiring. So I, I think you may kind of run into that a, a similar scenario here between the board members and things. So I'm, I am curious to see how this plays out um, outside of just the, the fans' perspective on what we want. You know, there, there's more things at play here for sure. You guys already touched on a lot of it. And I think it's it's going to be um, curious to kind of see who – which side wins. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if that's really the best way to put it, but anyway. Oh. I, it's kind of like the coaching auction more than it is the carousel. Like who wants yeah. this guy and how much you willing to pay? Because that's what happened to Arkansas when they hired Sam Pittman is that the fans apparently like what I was talking to someone in, in the athletic department, Link Hiffen wasn't initially like this big conversation that was occurring in the athletic department until the fans made their voice loud enough on it. And then the board members started making their voice loud enough on it. And then that's when Arkansas got interested. Kiffin was looking like he was going to Ole Miss no matter what. And then Arkansas and Jimmy Sexton happened, um, you know, so which is like, I don't know, mixing oil and gasoline to do the wrong thing at given times, it feels like. But that's uh, that's neither here nor there, but like, yeah, that's you know that same situation can play out if depending on who the board wants, who the donors want, it can make a huge impact on who Arkansas talks to. Yeah, and so you know we've got these three names here, but you think you start talking about other names, you know, we we've thrown out a few, you know, David, you mentioned Bucky, um, one of those kind of mid major coaches, you know, I know. Other names have been thrown out there, you know, some kind of crazy was, you know, I saw somebody say, go offer Jay Wright some money. Villanova's former coach that is currently sitting nice and happy in a CBS booth calling basketball games. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Gruden, right? it's the Gruden situation. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then another coach, you know, something on social media I've been seeing here is just right before we started up the show is somebody mentioned, and I get the idea of it, it'd be a home run hit with the fans, but would you have success? If somebody said bring Corliss Williamson in, a former player as head coach, <laughs> that he's currently in the NBA as an assistant. Because that works so well with Patrick Ewing and Chris Mullen uh, up at the Big East. Like, yeah, that, that stuff. <laughs> I'm just saying, guys. Hey, I just, the fans would go wild. The fans would go crazy. For I agree. The fans would go wild. Yes, so Slack of nine nine nine. That's what we're hearing is Will Wade or Chris Beard is the list. You know, I think Tang's up there and thrown around. I think he's probably out of those three, like we said, the one that's not like the other ones. Um, and who knows? I don't know if there could be somebody that we're not even thinking of that the athletic director's already having conversations with that would be a good hire that's going to come out of left field. There, you never know who – at who who they're talking to and and I think it's been made very clear that for Hunter Yurichek with everything that's gone on this has got to be a home run hire that he's got to hit with losing Muss with you know the video that came out last week that was edited from a few years ago makes a little bit more sense now in hindsight of oh you're still here kind of thinking when that came out, a lot of people were like, oh, Muss is coming back. But now you look at it this week, and it's a whole different story of was that your check kind of trying to play some games, being like, if you're leaving, you're oh, you're still here. And then him going on the podcast, we haven't even talked about that, going on the podcast earlier this week, 
kind of, you know, calling this bluff of saying there's no contract extension. There's no raise on the table. We've taken care of Muss the previous few years and made him a top 10, top 15 paid coach. So if he wants to be here, he'll be here. And, and that was, I feel like playing a little bit of hardball or like, like you're saying, trolling Muss with those videos. It really makes you think on, you know, did your chick really know the entire time that yes, Muss is probably gone is kind of just trying to push that along. And, you know, how long has he kind of really known that and been working behind the scenes with, like we've talked about, maybe some one of these coaches that, you know, you may see a hire really quickly, but that's been in the work for, you know, maybe a week now. Yeah. Yeah. The video is still, I, I it's perplexing. It, it, it's super perplexing. You know, the beautiful thing, I saw my favorite tweet uh, from one of these sports anchors down in Little Rock. Uh, they were talking about, uh, the beautiful thing about the video is that you can make it mean anything you want it to mean. Um, so like that's, I don't know if that was necessarily your check's way of doing that, but it, I, I do think the timing of everything, everything that has transpired over the last week and a half has been very coincidental, <laughs> if you will. Like it, it's, it's been shaped in a way where something was going to happen. Um, so like you had the, you know, the, video that your check tweeted out about, you know, you're still here. Well, now we're looking at that video. It's like, you're still here. Are you leaving or not? It is almost like the conversation now. And like you were you know, supposed to leave a week ago. What are you still doing here? Yeah. And all these other things. So yeah, I, I agree. The timing of everything right now is super weird. And going on the podcast was just strange, but you know, I, I don't know. Maybe Hunter Yurchek's an evil genius, and uh, like that's what he does. But I, I'm, I'm, when everything plays out, I will be very, very interested because someone even pointed out concerning this Chris Beard thing, we're playing Ole Miss this weekend in baseball. Just how the ironic! First game win actually tonight. Would it be Bobby interesting too. if a uh, Ole Miss coach came to watch this baseball series? I'm just saying, like that. <laughs> that's how weird everything is. <laughs> I was about to say, are we all sitting here? You know, looking in this, you know, thinking, oh, you know, Muss is out playing us in chess, whereas the whole time Hunter Check, you know, your check is sitting here playing 4D chess and his moves ahead, and something's going to happen really fast. Guys, I have one question, one question left. What do I do with this thing? Like, I, it, it's been <laughs> sitting on my set like this entire time and like all year since we got him. And like I, I don't know what to do with it now. Like it, it's well, gonna uh, to get some paint and just paint USC over the Razorback. I, I something, something like you know, get like, a sharpie and draw a beard on him. It, it's gonna have to go back here in the back with like my Scotty stuff and like all that other Razorback, you know, gear that you know, memorabilia that you know, this was the past. <laughs> you that or save it for the higher video and you rip his head off and make like a. I'm not salty. I'm not salty. <laughs> I was about to say, I understand that 100%, David, because I've got a nice basketball sitting behind me that is signed by Eric Muffman, and I feel the same way. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this now besides put it somewhere else because it's technically vintage and history now. Yeah. Cool thing about all that stuff is you can't – it's not like you're going to be able to get any more of it. So, yeah, it's all, it's all limited edition now. <laughs> Hopefully they halted the press on any further manufacturing of must bus shirts. Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of shirts, my wife also got me a really tacky must shirt that she found at the thrift store the other day. And it's, I mean, it's hideous. Um, so I don't know what I'm doing with that one from now on, cause I certainly can't wear that to basketball games anymore, but, uh, <laughs> it's the most tacky shirt you've ever seen. She loved it. She was, that it was awful. Her style. <laughs> I can attest to that. It was, it was, was awful. yeah. And I was about to say another note, you know, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but you know, shortly after, you know, all this came out and it was official must was taking the job. Lo and behold, you see him back on social media putting out, you know, a video. Hey, it's the Muslim family headed to Southern California. We can't wait to be there. Or, you know, picture of him sitting somewhere on campus signing his contract. So I, I think that was another thing fans really made a point about after the SEC tournament. Musk went radio silent on all social media. And, and that really is not his style. So it really started making people think, well, he's usually a guy that's out there putting out right. videos or, you know, something like that. And there's been nothing since the end of the SEC tournament. No, like, pressers, no nothing. He was supposedly on the road recruiting. 
and, and that might have been true to, to an extent, but how Who much was you that, recruiting for though? <laughs> yeah, it makes you think. Yes, he was probably recruiting in a sense, but how much of it was he trying to sell himself to, you know, whoever it was who it was, and turns out to be USC. Who knows how long those talks have been in place after, you know, their coach was probably in talks with SMU. So we don't really know how far back this timeline goes, but as quote unquote fast, we think this happened with the interview being that you don't really bring a guy in for an interview from what it was said was there probably already been numerous conversations had, and it was a, it's your job. If you want to come out here and let's iron out some details. And that's about it. I, yeah, I think that was the thing I was most disappointed about, um, you know, wish must the best, but, I mean, he had a fantastic fan base behind him for, for five years. And no mention, nothing of Arkansas. Just, hey, we're going to USC. Deuces. It's extremely strange. Um, I do I do want to talk about Caleb. You talked about recruiting just a little bit. And one of the things that I think the fan base was really upset about um, was the fact that right now there are no Arkansas kids on this roster uh, left. And I, I just want to kind of point out um, – you know, what you got coming in just in the state of Arkansas that a new coach could capitalize on, um, you know, so Arkansas typically, you know, as a program produces one to two kids at least in the top 100 on 24 seven every year per capita. Arkansas is a very rich basketball state and some of the best athletes play here. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity and, you know, compare that to even football, you're generating, like I said, one to two NBA level talent prospects coming out of Arkansas in a league that's 580 people. And you have right now the second highest total in the sec behind only Kentucky in the, or in the NBA right now. And you talk about all this homegrown talent, you got guys out of the next recruiting class who are going to be, you know, uh, Isaiah Seeley and Teron Burgess. Um, you know, just this last year in the top 100, you had Layden blocker and Rashad Marshall coming out of Arkansas uh, and then, you know, for this active class that's about to come into the SEC, you had out of the top 100, Anor Boating, who went to Missouri, and Dallas Thomas, who went to Clemson. You missed two huge recruits out of the top 100, and you currently have no Arkansans uh, out of all this basketball talent that's being produced. Like, right now in this league, in the alumni base that Arkansas has built, you know, you talk about Pat Beverly, Jordan Walsh, Jalen Williams, Moses Moody, Bobby Portis, Mason Jones, Nick Smith Jr., Anthony Black, and it goes on. And then you also talk about guys who just came from Arkansas, like Malik Monk, um, and all these other talented, talented players that are developed in a state that's only a population four million, and you're producing one to two possible NBA recruits every year. I, I think that's something Must did well a couple of years, but like over the last, we, it's been turned down, and we're missing a lot of the talent that the state has homegrown right in its own backyard. And I hope that it, whoever the next coach is can capitalize and bring those players in because we saw the success of what the Moses Moody, Jalen Williams and Debo Davis class brought in. And those were all top 150 prospects that came into Arkansas that season. I know one thing we haven't necessarily talked about that I think is going to be key and integral for maybe whoever comes in is I really think you got to try your hardest, whoever the new coach is, you've got to keep Ronnie Brewer Jr. on the staff. I agree. I was about to say he's been an integral part of recruiting, but also if you want to keep, you know, the the I think part of keeping that top in-state talent in, you know, Musk wasn't a big proponent of necessarily developing guys. He wants guys that can contribute right away, come in and play. And if you don't, where you might be seeing, you know, that's what happened with a few guys. Like you saw Ford leave. He wasn't getting play in time. You saw, you know, Barry Dunning, you know, just Justin Benning, yeah. this year, you know, Layden Blocker. Layden Blocker, guys that have the chance to be really, really good if they get the development instead of a win now mentality. But I think part of that is if you've got to keep a guy like Ronnie Brewer, who's from Arkansas, who's done it, been there, done that, made it to the league, has had success, you've got to keep him on staff one way or another if you want to, I feel like, keep success with in state recruits. 100%. I mean, there's one name, one name. And this is two people, but one name that crosses generations with Razorback fans. And that is Ronnie Brewer. Whether you're talking about Ronnie Brewer Sr. or Ronnie Brewer Jr., um, you know, they're both huge parts of Arkansas's history and basketball. And Ronnie Brewer Jr. has done an excellent job 
of recruiting some top level talent to come to Arkansas. And he's been part of that train. And then additionally, he's joined the coaching staff. He's a part of this. And then he's an NBA player on top of that, showing that home state, you know, homegrown kids can go to the league a hundred percent out of playing Arkansas. So, I mean, he, that name carries a lot of weight in that in this state. And whether, whether you're talking to someone old or young, like us who grew up as babies watching Ronnie Brewer. So, I mean, like, you know, it, it's it's a huge deal to keep Ronnie Brewer on this staff because right now he's one of the biggest bases for Arkansas. I yeah, and I think it. another thing to to take into account that that Mus was really good at that I think our next head coach needs to really kind of um, encompass and and what he does is you know one of the former players' dads I talked to said Mus was really good about reaching out, keeping up with the guys, making sure you know, that they they always felt welcomed and knew they were always part of the Razorback program. So keeping those those homegrown kids around, I think, is going to be a huge part of that because you're going to have, you know, these players that play for OKC, play for Dallas now, play for, you know, teams around here that are going to get that experience that, you know, a lot of other players aren't going to have this close to home. So, you know, I think that's going to be a huge part of, especially in-state recruiting. Um, Maddie, I won't reveal your source there or who you were talking to family-wise, but um, I, I'll ask, does his son currently play somewhere in the NBA very close? Possibly. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I know who it is. <laughs> hey, one, one quick thing I'll add as well that I think I would I personally would like to see a little bit better job of, I think Must did not the best job of, we're going to talk on kind of the opposite things. Um, is actually developing players. I mean, that, that's one thing that I thought we lacked it from time to time for Musselman. And I think that's something that if you do, you know, that, that's another thing you might want to have that box checked off, maybe a little bit better than, than Musselman did on whoever you go out and hire um, at keeping some of those guys around that, that don't play as much with the, the, the aspect that, hey, we can develop you and get you on the court next year or the year after or whatever the case may be. You, you know, yeah, you're a freshman right now. But I thought Bay Fall was going to be kind of maybe one of those types of players that didn't wasn't quite to the level that he could play this year, but I thought he was going to be a big piece next year if everything would have worked out in Muslim State and things of that nature. Yeah, if I, the development I, would happen. So that, that to me, has got to be a, uh, a critical factor, I think, that we need to improve on in whoever we hire. I, I'm 100% there with you because like, you know, we, we all interpret it. If you follow basketball pretty hardcore, you all got, everybody got the impression that Bayfall was going to be a project at Arkansas and he wasn't necessarily supposed to contribute his first year. And I think even Bayfall knew that. I think that his entering the transfer portal has to do with Musselman leaving. Um, but for Bayfall, like, yeah, I think we were all under the interpretation that he sophomore, junior year, that's when we would start seeing the Arkansas version of, I don't know, Oscar Shibwe. Um, you know, the, you know, the guy who stays around forever and dominates the paint um, was the kind of the hope. Um, and then like, yeah, certainly. So you wish that you got guys like Joseph Pinion a little bit more floor time because people forget back in that season uh, last year, that 2022, 2023 season, Joseph Pinion had a better offensive rating than Nick Smith Jr. So it, it just kind of shows just the potential that some of these guys had. And I'll be very curious to watch hap what happens at Arkansas State with Darian Ford and Joseph Pinion going over there and going under a very good coach at Arkansas State, one of uh, Nate Oates' former assistants. So um, there, there's a lot of potential that, you know, some of these kids, you know, that must just didn't develop uh, well enough or, you know, so on and so forth, which is ironic because I, I never thought we'd be talking about it this way because one of the things that John Cal Perry out of Kentucky praised Eric Musselman was his development of young players um, when they were developing guys to go to the NBA. So I, it, it's a crazy, it's a conversation I never thought we'd have when we hired Eric Musselman at Arkansas. Can I make an addendum to the coaching hire? Sure. Can whoever, and if anybody watching watches the Hoop Southbound show, they know exactly where I'm going with this. Can we also poach the nutrition and weightlifting coach from Kentucky while we're at it? <laughs> the, the arrow transformation was amazing. <laughs> like, like half of that team gained at least 30 pounds of muscle. He just literally said, like, yeah, I just followed the nutrition plan. Like, bro, I need that nutrition plan, man. Like, hook me up. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, another funny thing that I, I saw we were talking about coaching hours that it, it would be interesting if it ever happened. And I think it'd be a big um, one of the mo biggest splashes you could make is somebody said, I know it would never happen. Go out and offer Don Staley from South Carolina. Give her a chance to coach men's basketball. Let's I mean, do it. I am in 100 percent. 
I'm not against it. I, I love watching Don Staley coach, so I'm not against Seth. Seth, I know, I know, you're probably over there, like, mm, yeah. <laughs> dude. I would be down. I think, I think that's one way that you um, you add to the fan base even more than you already got. In a way, I mean, that sounds crazy, but you know what I mean? Like, I think that'd be a way you could even get more people to kind of buy in in a different route. Um, and I, I think she's got the cojones to do it, man. I really do. <laughs> well, she's certainly a great basketball coach. Um, but yeah, no, it certainly felt also. I, I understand the hesitation, though, in a realistic aspect of like, OK, here's the dice, you know, like and it wouldn't even be a basketball on the court thing. It would be recruiting. Um, but like I, I'd 100 percent take a risk like that would be fun if Don Staley's interested. Sure, come on. Like, let's do it. Like, Try it for a couple of years, man. Dion, I'm down for this. Like, let's do it. <laughs> it's like break through there and break that barrier. Let's go. Like, you know. So, but that that's something interesting. I saw somebody out there threw that name out there. You know, she's been in South Carolina. I have a very strong feeling she's going to retire at South Carolina. But I have but a lot of respect for what she's done at that South Carolina program. One hundred percent. You know, being there and the, what she's established there is insane. And you know we can only hope to get somebody at Arkansas that sees Arkansas. Like you said, back to that idea of you don't really leave for other jobs and Arkansas is not a quote unquote stepping stone. And not to say that Moss used it as a stepping stone. We know he wanted to go home, but he came in and had success and then was like, okay, peace out. I'm going home. And we, I think you want to get a coach in here that's going to come in and be here Long term, in a sense, like you know, mentioned at the beginning of the show, David, the average lifespan, if you will, a coach at one school is 4.1 years. So you don't really see coaches staying besides, you know, the greats or the the better coaches like your Bill Self before they retire, you Roy Williams, Mike Krzyzewski, guys like that. They're at programs or even Cal that's been there for years. You don't see that anymore. It's the exception. It's the exception. And. What, I want to be the exception too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, also, like, don't forget what those coaches did. They won national championships, and that typically is the thing that gets you tenured at a at a coaching position. And for so many guys, like Virginia hasn't let go of Bennett yet. Like, you know, there's you keep going down the list. Like Scott Drew, I don't know if he's leaving Baylor anytime soon. Um, you know, like the coaches like that, Nolan Richardson stayed as long as he could at Arkansas after he won a national championship. So when you get a guy who wins a national championship, they tend to hang around for a while. Um, so like, that's the other side of that story too, as well. And it's cause the fans love them. That's the other part of it too, is they don't want to let go. They won't want to let go of history or anything else. I mean, and, and like you said, that's that championship kind of solidifies you, if you will, cause you know, you look at. An example in the SEC, Coach Cal, he's won one title at Kentucky in all these years with all that talent he's had. I mean, that's been getting questioned after this year. But you look at how long he's been there with one title, with the immense talent that he's had throughout the years, all the NBA talent, yet he has one title to show for it. He also has a $33 million buyout. Exactly. <laughs> Part of – that I won't get into that. I got into it with Kentucky fans. It's like, again, which just seems to be a trend on my show is me saying something than Kentucky getting mad at me. So <laughs> it's, it, surprise, it's surprise. the rule, not the exception at this point. Yeah, exactly. It's the rule. <laughs> Kentucky well, or Auburn, pick your poison. One of them are going to be mad at you, David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And so, you know, I mean, I – as far as with all this going on, you know, we'll keep you guys updated from both of our viewpoints as far as what happens within, I'm going to say the next 48 hours, I wouldn't be, I hope, I really hope we have a coach within the next 48 hours. That way I they can get on a wild it. weekend. Yeah, it, it's going to be a wild weekend. If rumors are to be believed, it's going to be a wild weekend. That That's true. We've got to have David on plane tracking duty. Um, <laughs> and so, so yeah. I mean, if you guys don't know anything else, Dave and Maddie, you can let everybody know, you know, where they can catch you at if you're on the Arkansas side of things. So, yeah, for sure. So I want to thank Caleb and Seth for letting us do this uh, joint together. We actually had a different show planned uh, that we were going to do together, um, but uh, that plan certainly fell through um, when this news broke. But uh, if you guys have not checked out the Hoop Southbound show, we greatly appreciate it if you guys went over there uh, and checked us checked us out. Uh, it's at Hoop Southbound on YouTube and anywhere that you get your social media at. Uh, we're on Twitter, Instagram, all over the place. Um, all the but, podcasting yeah, platforms. All the podcasting platforms. Uh, so we ask, please 
like and subscribe. Um, you know, we're not just talking basketball during basketball season. We are talking about it the whole time through. Like, so right now we're, of course, deep into March Madness content right now, talking about the Final Four. Um, but it's all from an SEC perspective. So we're really hanging on to Alabama's run right now. Um, but once we get there, we start offseason content. We'll be talking about uh, NBA draft uh, and the players from the SEC who are going to be considered for the NBA draft. And we're going to be doing scattering reports and putting information together on them uh, in digestible videos. And then we'll also be doing this summer a new series that we call The Portal, which for Arkansas is going to be very relevant. Uh, so, like, yeah, pay attention to that one. That should be coming out in July after the NBA draft is when we'll start that series. So June, July time frame. And then in August, we start Freshman 15. Uh, and Freshman 15 counts down the top 15 freshmen who are coming into the SEC according to 24-7 Sports. That'll also be similar to our draft profiles where we break down, break down all the film, talk about these guys, their strengths, their weaknesses, and what we expect out of them coming into the next season. So, yeah, if you guys haven't checked out Hoop Southbound, please come over, check us out. And then, of course, we start the whole process back over in late August, early September when we start doing season previews. So, yeah, please come over and check out the Hoop Southbound show. Like and subscribe. We love having you guys here. Um, and also like and subscribe to these guys. They're good. Yeah, like David said, there's a good chance that you might see more collaborations from us with everything going on with Arkansas. There's going to be a lot to talk about in this offseason with roster turnover and everything. But like said, you know, Dave said, go check them out. Fantastic things there. You know, check us out. Hit that like and subscribe button. You know, we produce as much Regback content as we can. We have our weekly show that, you know, I guess is going to be pushed off this week due to this news. Yeah. But we also have our recap show that we do every Monday regarding baseball. Um and we'll have some guests from time to time. Last week we had Matt Goodhart, former baseball player. If you missed that, Seth was out on some family vacation stuff. So, you know, we're all the time trying to bring you new and unique content. And so like and hit that subscribe button. That helps us tremendously. We're on all the platform podcast platforms, just like Maddie said with Hoop Southbound. You can find us there too. And so we'll keep you guys updated with what we hear, what we find out. You know, and like we said, the next 48 hours is going to be crazy in the state of Arkansas and with Razorback Nation. But hopefully at the end of that, we have a new coach. The outlook is optimistic and promising, and we can get back to work and look at what this new, next era of Arkansas basketball is going to look like. So we'll see you guys later, and go check out these channels. And until next time.